Dr. Schuster, thank you for inviting me. Uh, I feel very honored. And my name is Marianne Cohen, and I am a fellow of the Academy of Psychosomatic Medicine in the past, and now uh, the uh, fellow of the Academy of Consultation Liaison Psychiatry. And when I, um, I guess I, you, I don't know how much you want to know about me, but I am a, a clinical professor of psychiatry. I'm a voluntary professor at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. And basically, I've been a consultation liaison psychiatrist since 1973. And, um, <clears throat> probably since 1972, but officially since 1973, when I actually founded a consultation service during my residency training program at a city hospital. And um, when I found myself in the academy of what was then psychosomatic medicine, I found myself a professional home. But before that, um, I actually founded my own professional home in the Society for Liaison Psychiatry, because at the time there was absolutely no organization of consultation liaison psychiatry in the country that I knew of. And um, Dr. Donald Lipset had uh, made an announcement in what was then um, medicine in psych psychiatry and medicine. And in that um, journal, he had suggested that people who were working in consultation liaison psychiatry begin to form regional local organizations so that the, the subspecialty that was to become consultation liaison psychiatry could survive. And my supervisor during my residency training um, at that time in 1973 suggested that I do that. He had read the um, announcement, I think, that was probably written in 1973 when he read it. I, um, I, he and I and a third person, so Dr. Jay Leffer and Dr. Raymond Rakow and I, uh, co-founded the Society for Liaison Psychiatry. Um, and I really fell in love with consultation liaison psychiatry during my residency training because it seemed to me that it was the only field that actually emphasized humanistic, compassionate, and comprehensive biopsychosocial approach to humans. And um, for me, humanizing medicine was really important at the time. And I also felt that there was a lot of discrimination. It was pretty early, you know, the civil rights movement had occurred and the women's rights movement had occurred, but actually um, the reality is that it was pretty early and um, there was a lot of obvious prejudice in the field and tremendous health care disparities. And it bothered me that not only were people who were economically disadvantaged stigmatized, but people who were of color were stigmatized, and people who were mentally ill were multiply stigmatized. And I felt that consultation liaison psychiatry was, the really, was really the field that we could change that, we could do something about it together. And so I founded that organization, and when I graduated from residency, I became director of the Consultation Liaison Psychiatry Service at the City Hospital <clears throat> that closed at the end of that year. Not because I became CL director, but uh, it, be it became a political football of some sort, and it was closed. And so I needed to get a job when I saw that it was closing. And I looked around and there were no jobs, so I decided to take a fellowship, even though I had practiced running a consultation liaison psychiatry service with supervision, but running the service from 1973 to 1975. And um, I was able to find a fellowship program at Albert Einstein College of Medicine um, in Montefiore. 
And the Montefiore program was a huge, wonderful program. My supervisors included Jimmy Holland, Sigurd Ackerman, Myron Hofer, and um, Dr. Strain, and a whole fantastic group of teachers who were very, very influential. And uh, Dr. Holland told me to join the um, American Psychosomatic Society and the American College of Physicians, which I, I did. And um, I actually gave my first presentation at the American Psychosomatic Society, but going to the meetings really never turned, I, I guess they never really inspired me or, or seemed to have the same feeling that I, I got from doing the work that I did every day in consultation liaison psychiatry. The meetings were interesting, but they weren't, to me, very inspiring. And by the time I got to um, the end of my fellowship, I was given a position as a consultation liaison psychiatrist in the general medical clinic at Montefiore. And, um, I was there until 1981 when the AIDS epidemic began. So at Montefiore, I'd seen a lot of elderly people with diabetes and um, other chronic medical illnesses. I was involved with uh, taking care of people with diabetes and, and heart disease and cancer. And then um, off to Metropolitan Hospital Center, which was another city hospital. At, in July of 1981. And there I, I found HIV. And in HIV, I found a field that magnified and personified what I thought consultation liaison psychiatry was all about. And I developed a, a team approach to the discrimination and HIV stigma that surrounded the epidemic at the beginning. And that that was what I called a biopsychosocial approach to AIDS in a program at a city hospital in which half the beds were filled with people who were at the last stages of illness because it wasn't recognized until late and people didn't know how to diagnose it because there's no test for it or no drugs for it. And actually when I started there, it was one month after the disease was first described in the Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report in 1981, so in June. And so I started July 1st, and um, my, colleagues and, my colleagues and I ran the program, and one of my fellows was um, really talented, and we together um, gave a, a poster session at the first international conference on AIDS where Jimmy Holland gave a plenary session on the, on the psychosocial aspects of AIDS. And after that, we wrote up what we had done in the, in the hospital in, um, in a paper called A Biopsychosocial Approach to AIDS. It had already been described in the literature by um, a British medical student who needed to write a thesis about, about programs to deal with AIDS in America. And, um, at that point, I wrote the we wrote the paper, and I was shocked, actually, and very surprised to win the Dorfman Paper Award at this organization called the Academy of Psychosomatic Medicine, which I didn't really know anything about. So I was invited by Tom Wise, and Dr. Wise was a most incredible mentor. We never worked together, but he just, I don't know, he liked the paper. And, and my colleague Henry Weissman and I were, were very shocked to be the recipients of an award for a paper. It's the only award I've ever gotten for a paper, and I got it in 1986, shortly after, well, we had been running the program for a few years. And um, we came to the meeting, and I met him. I met Dr. Wise, and I met the other people who were in the leadership of the organization, and I felt that I'd found a real home, a real professional home. And is that the year you joined the academy? In, in I joined, no, well, I went to the meeting. I didn't actually go to the meeting. I went to the award lunch. Mm -hmm. 
like <laughs> the one we just came from. And I went to the award lunch and got, received the award, spoke to the leaders of, of the organization at the time, particularly to Tom, who was very, I mean, I felt we were talking the same language and doing the same work, even though we were doing it in two different places. I had been familiar with some of his work. I had never met him before, and I was <laughs> really thrilled to meet him. And he was very encouraging and very inspiring. Um, and then, then, of course, I joined. And it took me a while to get, you know, I guess references and things. And I, I joined in 19, uh, 1987, the following year. I mean, I already felt like I was a member when I went to that luncheon. And uh, it felt really welcome. I, f I felt that it was a field that there weren't really many people who, it was, I guess, pretty early in, in the, the days of consultation liaison psychiatry. And the work of uh, Lepowski and Engel seemed to me to be really giving me a recipe for how patients should be thought of and taken care of. And I tried to follow it, and I had, um, the experience of working with uh, a really large number of people in a city hospital. And I found that there were psychiatrists there and there were, uh, there were a social worker and two nurse practitioners and clinical nurse specialists. And together, we, we've, I formed a team that worked with patients on the inpatient service, the outpatient service, and we educated throughout the hospital. We educated security guards about de-escalating in violence. We, um, we just saw the problems and we addressed them, basically. Experience? I think so. I think, you know, there's, there's a, there's a horrible sign since uh, the tragedies of 9-11 um, that in all the subways it says, if you see something, say something. Well, this is long before that. Well, you know, if you see a backpack, don't pick it up, say something. And that's really what I think I, I felt like I was doing and that what you really need to do. If you see something, even if it's a practice that everybody's used to doing, and they're doing it all the time, but it seems wrong, that it's something that you need to think about and maybe develop a program to address. When people were, for the biggest example, is leaving food outside the rooms and not going into AIDS patients' rooms to clean the floor, um, call it something and write about it and make sure to call attention to it and form a big group. So what we did when, you know, I went into my first AIDS patient when I was um, in that first month um, of the program, um, I suggested that we get together with all of the subspecialists in the hospital, the infectious disease specialists, the respiratory therapists, the uh, nutritionists, the dietitians, the nurses, the social workers, and form a program, we called it the Metropolitan AIDS Program. And it was, the, the director was, we, there were three of us directing it. It was, uh, I was directing it. I was the head of consultation liaison psychiatry, the director who was uh, the other director of infectious disease, and the social worker who was most interested in it um, was also the director. So the three of us directed it and we met on a regular basis to talk about what the problems were with our patients getting, getting food, getting care, being seen, why, you know, how we can help interns and residents and medical students not be too afraid of working with the patients. So my message to uh, new people would be really, if you see something, say something, even if it's just to yourself, and figure out if you can make a liaison and form a team and really take care of someone from a very, very comprehensive standpoint. It, it's really what I think people need to keep doing and in different settings and in different ways. Mm -hmm. 
Well, you know, I think the main thing was that we, we really um, have formal structures for having mentorships. I actually never had a formal mentor. I kind of got mentors by just trying to reach out and, and work with people who seem to be interested and seem to have similar, um, similar as were interested in similar aspects of the field as well. So I consider, I consider Tom Wise a mentor, but I also thought that many other people were mentors as well. I mean, I had other mentors, mentors like um, Chuck Ford, Bill Webb, Tom Hackett, although I never worked with him. Um, I had mentors that didn't even know me, actually, but people like, like uh, and, and, and it sounds like the academy was sort of the vehicle for establishing those mentorship relationships. Yeah, that was the, the academy was the first time where it was, like, it was clearly known that you might mentor someone, and, and someone might want to be a mentor, and someone might want to be mentored. So there was a, a, a formal structure. I don't know if it still exists, but... Uh, there was, you could sign up and say you wanted to be a mentor, and then people came and got mentored by you. And so I had been doing that informally since establishing a program at the first city hospital, but never formalized it or called it a mentorship. I didn't even really know the term. And there weren't really many uh, women mentors in the field either at that time. So most of my actual, almost all of my supervisors, except for Jimmy, were, were men. So it was a very, I think the, the Academy did an amazing uh, job by formalizing it and also giving a place that was very acceptable for people to talk about what they were doing not uh, in, in the field, in, in addition to research, but also the clinical work that they were doing and the programs that they were creating, uh, you know, which are actually, the, I think, the heart of what Consultation Liaison Psychiatry is about. It, it changed, really, along with the society, I think, with, with society itself, with the way medicine was changing, with the way um, care is being given, and it changed in really very exciting ways. And it was always, to me, it was always on, because the choices of the themes for each year always seemed to be on the cutting edge of whatever was the most important aspect of consultation liaison psychiatry at the time. And I think, you know, at, at this point in time, um, it's, medicine's really at a, at a, well, medicine's under siege. <laughs> it's at a crossroads. It's, um, it's dealing with burnout uh, throughout the field. People are being overwhelmed. Uh, one, of, one of my um, members of my family went to a doctor who said that he spends most, of, he's a, He's a cardiologist, and he spends most of his time, more of his time, doing electronic medical record inputting, getting prior authorizations, doing administrative work. Actually, his medical school um, did a, a survey of their, of their doctors, and he was found to, to be actually spending less time with patients or, and with teaching than he was with inputting and prior authorizing. And it's kind of tragic. So they did a little intervention. They, they gave him uh, the ability to uh, dictate, which was funny because we had dictation. We had to do dictation years ago. Before, before there were computers. So here we are, uh, some people are, are actually dictating into the computer. So there are, are programs in which you can do that if you're very, you know, 
if you're very uncomfortable with using electronic medical records. But I mean, I, I think they're, they're fine as long as you don't um, look at the computer or turn your back to the patient as one of my um, internists that I met for the first time when my other internist retired after 40 years of being my internist. He retired and I went to a new internist who literally turned his back and said, you don't mind my back, do you? On a first visit. And he turned toward the wall and inputted his uh, interview or whatever he was doing into the computer while talking to me. So it was a little bit disconcerting. I said, no, I don't mind. Of course, I didn't go back, mm -hmm. but. <laughs>Well, I think the, the most important thing is to, if, you, if you love what you do, and it's, as Jimmy Holland says, if it's still fun. Um, she had a, a very nice slide of an ant going uphill, pushing a huge boulder, and another, another ant going down the hill and saying, why are you still doing this? And the ant going up the hill with the boulder says, because it's still fun. <laughs> and you know, it is still fun for me because I have found an area of, of taking care of patients that's just inspiring every day. It's something I want to do because I want to do whatever I can to eliminate discrimination in healthcare, to eliminate healthcare disparities, to really bring the joy, the compassion, the empathy, the comprehensiveness, and taking care of a real whole patient back to medicine was something, pathetically enough, that we, we started doing in consultation liaison psychiatry, I started doing in the 70s, because we were worried then about the technological aspects of medicine and the subspecialization of medicine destroying the doctor-patient relationship. I mean, Corshin Negretti was writing about that in the pediatrics uh, journals in, uh, in about his pediatric experience. And we wrote about it at Montefiore about communication in a medical clinic because we were trying to rehumanize medicine. So it's, it's not, you know, it's not new. It's just that there have been things added to it to make it more difficult. And we were rather, a lot of us were rather ambiguous, had very am, ambi ambiguous feelings about whether or not to become a subspecialty. <clears throat> and I was part of the first task force on subspecialization that was run by Chuck Ford and part of the second task force on subspecialization in um, practically over a decade later or more, and with Dr. Costas Lyketsos and Dr. Wise. And it was all dependent on what was going on in the, in the world at the time. In the world at the time that we started in the 80s trying to get subspecialization for, for consultation liaison psychiatry, geriatrics had just gotten it, and addiction had just gotten it, and neuropsychiatry was going to get it. And all these subspecialties were, were kind of getting to be too much. And I think there was some very mixed feelings about whether there should be one. But it was very clear that if we didn't get accredited as a subspecialty, that we wouldn't have a subspecialty mm -hmm. at all. And there wouldn't be lines or fellowships or, or fellows. So I think we all converted very quickly to, and got on the bandwagon and, and realized we saw something, so we said something again, and there we were with um, the first task force and then the second task force. But the t times had changed between the two, and it seemed like having consultation liaison psychiatry with its collaborative approach and integrative care was really the thing that was needed. And even more recently than that, the change of the name was accepted. Initially, we we could only become we could only become a subspecialty called psychosomatic medicine, which to all of 
everyone was a, a kind of a, a very pejorative, not very pleasant name. If you say that in, in a, to lay public, it sounds like, oh, you're the doctors that, that think it's all in their heads, right? You don't believe that we have symptoms. And, and that's a very, very negative way to characterize your subspecialty. And so, but then there's consultation liaison psychiatry, and there's, you know, there's questions about that too. It's a little awkward, it's a little strange, nobody knows what you're talking about, and, and liaison has also some weird connotations. So, uh, <laughs> it's, but it's a lot better, because that's really what we do. So it, it's descriptive, but it doesn't describe the population we serve. Well, the best part of the growth is that I've had a lot of people to mentor, which was wonderful. I mean, it's, it's a really wonderful place because you're mentoring people who really want to get into consultation liaison psychiatry. When you mentor people who are students and they haven't decided yet, they may go into it or they may go into something else, which is fine, you, you know, as long as they enjoy the subspecialty while they're rotating on it or taking an elective in it. But getting mentees from consultation liaison psychiatry uh, the organization like this really gives you people who want to do what you're doing and you're not, you're not you're really helping them develop and grow, and it's, it's a very special possibility. It's a good, that's really a good question because I think the advantage of growth is that we can do so much more. We can have such big, wonderful meetings with great speakers and terrific presentations. I think perhaps the intimacy and um, the, the really small um, initial way of, of relating is more difficult. Uh, the, the meetings we just heard, we needed to not clink our glasses because this is going to make more noise and it's harder to speak to each other. The first meeting I went to was very, very quiet because there were very few tables and there were very few people. I mean, not, it wasn't a meeting, it was just a luncheon, but that luncheon didn't have, it was in a smaller room. There were very few people and the people who were there, I think at the time in 1986, the organization seemed to be dying. It wasn't, I think, really that Tom Wise and Bill Webb and Tom Hackett really completely changed it within those years in the 80s. They just came in and they created what was really a consultation liaison psychiatry organization. They even linked consultation. It was uh, Psychosom Academy of Psychosomatic Medicine, the organization of consultation and liaison psychiatry. I don't know why the end came in there, but it did. And, but that was what attracted our Society for Liaison Psychiatry. We started the Society for Liaison Psychiatry in 1973 with three people. And then we expanded it to all of the directors, and then we expanded it to everyone who wanted to come. So now we have 377 members as of now, and it exists still. Now that organization, when, when Bill Webb was uh, president and I was president at the same year of uh, the Society for Liaison Psychiatry, I asked him if he would like to come to one of our meetings and consider making some sort of connection with our organization. And he agreed and he came and he was another person who became someone that I, I really admired and thought was wonderful. And he, um, he had the, I don't know what you want to call it, I don't know what it's officially called, but we think of ourselves as the regional metropolitan New York regional organization of 
the Academy of Consultation Liaison Psychiatry. And that happened really during, I think, his presidency, which was probably mm -hmm. in 1987. And so building that bridge led to that formal affiliation. Yes, yeah. and I was already, I had just become a member, but by the time it was more formalized, I think, I was, I got um, elevated to fellow after only three years, in 1990, I became a fellow of the Academy and I could serve on committees. And I was chair of the membership committee. And I think that that year, we brought in about 170 people mm -hmm. from the society. I haven't officially mm -hmm. verified that, but in my record, I think that it was 170 people that we brought in to a very small organization. <laughs> there was a lot of people. And it was all the people from the Society for Liaison Psychiatry and we were very excited and very proud to be affiliated with this wonderful organization that was now calling itself the Organization of Consultation Liaison Psychiatry and moving towards subspecialization. So it was an exciting time. Well, yeah, thank you. I would like to do that because just recently, um, I was contacted by, um, by a, a fourth-year resident who was interested in becoming a member of the Academy of Consultation Liaison Psychiatry and possibly contributing to any work that we were doing. And, and he is working with us. And I invited him to join our special interest group. So 30 years after forming the Society for Liaison Psychiatry in 2003, I, uh, I founded the Organization of AIDS Psychiatry, which became the special interest group, the HIV AIDS Psychiatry Special Interest Group of the, the Academy. So he, I asked him if he wanted to be a, um, a rotating trainee co-chair of our SIG. Our SIG started with 32 members in 2003, and we now have around 480 members. Um, we started a bioethics SIG in 2003, and I think we had about 12 members, and we now have about 380 members as well. So it's a wonderful way. The SIGs are an absolutely wonderful way for a, a young person to join, become active, become part of the administration, and really see how the administration works and start to work with it. So he did a funny thing. So he wrote to me and he said, well, what's the job description of, <laughs> what's the job description of a co-chair? And I said, well, Actually, you need to be really passionate about the field you, that you're going into, that you're, that's your special interest. You, you need to um, be interested in helping, maybe writing, maybe updating the web, the web page, perhaps taking minutes, because we all have to take minutes because the, the meetings go so quickly. If, if you don't have the, the co-chairs taking minutes and the, the rotating co-chairs taking minutes, you're going to miss something. And I said, but you know, since you asked the question, I'll give you some materials and I'll ask you if you could write up a uh, job description for the chair, the co-chair, and for the rotating co-chairs. And he did, <laughs> and um, he's, he's written that up and we distribute it to all the SIG leaders. But also the other thing that I think is really important that Dr. Becca Brandel is doing now is she, just, she is making liaisons w internationally. And that I think is an in incredibly important aspect because the training is not as formalized as it is here in uh, the United States. And a lot of people can benefit from, I, th I think, the kinds of things that we're doing. And, and the organizations can benefit tremendously from the, the work 
that I think that the Academy is doing. So she has, is now doing that kind of, of liaison globally. It's not so easy. I have to say that I, try, I thought, you know, since 73% of AIDS patients are in sub-Saharan Africa, I tried to um, suggest to the World Psychiatric Association that AIDS was a global problem in psychiatry and that we had to have a section of the World Psychiatric Association. And I suggested year after year for, for nine years, from 2003 when we formed the special interest group to 2012. But in 2012, Dr. Pedro Ruiz was the president of the World Psychiatric Association. And that year, when I wrote, and actually I wrote with a, with a, a, a colleague, a, a resident from uh, Italy, and the two of us wrote to Dr. Pedro Ruiz, and in a half an hour he said, of course, I'll bring it up, and on February 12th, <laughs> 2012, we became a provisional section, and on, in 2014 we became full status section. Uh, the 66th section of the World Psychiatric Association. Sure. So once again, see something, say something. And so <laughs> these are the things you can do as a young person joining the academy. And I think this is the, the ideal home for psychiatrists who would like to really improve care and really improve the way care is delivered.